15 years ago. Changed the world. Changed our life. Changed the economy. Changed the way that we perceived God. There's a scripture found in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. And Jesus was on the cross. And he cries out to God. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? He felt the presence of God leaving. Same maybe the feeling that we feel sometimes. Where is the presence of God? Where is God? You know, in all of our lives, we have certain events that we will never forget. We will never forget the moment, the people that were around us, the place that we were when we heard those events. I was a senior in high school in that first event, 1981, tell you my age, the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan. I could tell you I was a senior in high school, we were at track practice and our coach called us together and told us that there was an assassination attempt on President Reagan. I'll never forget that. I remember exactly where I was, I remember exactly who was with me, and I remember exactly who told me. There was another event, the Space Shuttle Challenger. January 28th, 1986, at 11.39 a.m. Do you remember that? Remember exactly where you were? Do you remember exactly watching that and how many times that you watched that space shuttle completely be destroyed 73 seconds after takeoff? I'll never forget that. There was a lighter time that I'll never forget. It was the O.J. Simpson verdict. Remember that? I, I, how many of you watched from Gaggle? I mean, we watched that whole stupid thing. And then in shock, whether you agree or disagree, decided October 3rd, 1995. But there's an event that's in the pinnacle of time, especially in the United States of America and around the world, 9-11. You don't even have to have a name for it. Attacks of series of four coordinated terrorist attacks of an Islamic terrorist group called Al-Qaeda in the United States on the morning of September 11, 2001. I'll never forget where I was. I was right here. I was, hope, I was hosting a pastor's meeting of the state of Kansas, and we had tons of pastors in here. And All of a sudden, the secretary came out and was talking to the pastor and said, hey, hey, did you see what was taking place? So all the pastors left to the pastor's meeting, and we were in the old auditorium, and we had the TV on, and we were all sitting there, and we all were in shock as we watched the white billowing smoke come out of the North Tower. We were in shock. In amazement, and a few minutes later, the South Tower was hit. Pastor Al was there, pastored in Valley Center. And a bunch of pastors getting together at the altar, the moment that it was taking place, and we bowed our heads, and we prayed, we knew that the world has changed, and we knew that God had to be proclaimed. But how in the world do we talk about an event that was so horrific, so we sang this song, or we listened to the song, Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning? And I want to ask a question to you, and I want to answer that question. God, where were you on September 11th when the world stopped turning? Where were you? We have a lot of questions about where was God or what God was doing, or how could God allow something horrific like this take place? And there's all kinds of questions. There's all kinds of of questions about where God was and what God was doing and how God could allow such horrific events take place with so innocent people. The same place he was when Adam rebelled in Eden. He was waiting to cover your sins. I want to talk to you about issues in the Bible where God was waiting and God had a purpose and we may not understand the purpose and we may not even agree with God. But we have to understand, God is in control. See, see, God created the heavens and the earth. And God created a perfect environment. And God created Adam. And when God created Adam, He found out that Adam was not complete. So God created Adam, a helpmate, a completer, if you would. 
And God walked with them in the Garden of Eden in early on in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. God was in the perfect place, in the perfect environment with Adam and Eve. And the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. So not only in the physical realm, but also in the invisible realm, God created the heavens. And God walked in perfect harmony with man until one day, when God was gone, a serpent, the Satan, came as a serpent and he deceived Eve and Adam. And when they deceived, they took what God says, do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve said it looked good, it was good to eat. And Satan said, you're not going to die. Just partake so you will know as God knows. So they partook of that forbidden fruit. They already knew good. They walked with God. They understood the presence of God. They understood the peace of God. They understood how God loved them and how God created them and how God brought them together in the perfect environment. But they were not satisfied with that. But as soon as they partook of the forbidden fruit... They realized the opposite of good. Their eyes were open to the good and evil. And from this moment on, from the Garden of Eden until 9-11, evil has prevailed in this world. But God, God is still on the throne God allowed men and women to have a volitional will to decide what they will do and what they would not do. Does that mean God could have stopped it? Absolutely. Could God stop Eve? Could God have stopped Adam? Absolutely. But just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he has given you a volitional will to decide yes or no, to do or not to do, as you will. That's a big heavy load. Because God could have created us as robots. He could have created us and say, you will do as I tell you, when I tell you, how I tell you. Any, any parents in here, how does that work for us? <laughs> but when we can't do something, we do something. And Adam and Eve decided, I want to try this. They were deceived. And when they were deceived, their eyes were open, and it changed the world. Evil entered this world because of a choice not of you and I but a choice of Adam and Eve and because of that choice the sin nature our hearts are desperately wicked because of sin because of evil that was brought into this world now I, I'd love to tell you the end of that story the end of that story is they were they were banished from the Garden of Eden they were banished. But as they were banished from the Garden of Eden, God walked Satan, Adam and Eve, out of the Garden of Eden. And he looked over to Satan, and he said, You are cursed. Your defeat is imminent. You are cursed. From this day on, you will go on on your belly, eating the dust of this world. And he looked over to Adam. Adam being fearful because he knew he just betrayed God. He knew that his eyes were open. Now he knows evil. And he knew that God, the creator of the world, just cursed the one that deceived him. And he looked at Adam. And he said, Cursed is the ground. Cursed is the ground. God always deflects the curse of sin so you can have the freedom and mercy of grace. Somebody give me an amen. You are not cursed. You are blessed. Even though we sin, God deflected the sin to the ground so sooner or later it will be applied to the cross. Adam could have been accursed right there, and we would be cursed. But God 
deflected the curse of sin to the ground to sooner or later be put upon the back of Jesus. That's when sin entered. But the same place he was when Noah built the ark. He was protecting him from the disaster. Noah, for hundreds of years, was proclaiming God, Messiah, Lord. And nobody listened. He proclaimed it, and nobody listened. And he started building the ark for hundreds of years, proclaiming. And no one accepted God as the Messiah. Nobody accepted God. So at the end of the ark building, he went into the ark and he shut the doors and Noah and his sons and their wives and his wife was saved. But the world was destroyed. All the way from Adam and Eve, from generation to generation to generation, the evilness of this world took over the world. And the Bible says, as the days of Noah will be, will be the day that the Son of God comes back to receive us. The world was a very wicked place. And in that wickedness, God still provided safety for those who loved him, for those who were righteous within him. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. He was a man, not a perfect man, but a righteous man. A man who faithfully proclaimed the righteousness of God. So where was God on 9-11? The same place he was when Job lost everything he had. Proving himself to be God despite unfortunate circumstances. There was no more than the flood of disastrous proportions compared to an individual person that lost everything. That lost his cattle, lost his family. His wife said, curse God and die. He was under major personal devastation. But he realized that God would never leave him. And he was a righteous man, and God would never forsake him. Even though Satan himself, the one that deceived Adam and Eve, went to the very throne of God and said, the only way Job is righteous is because of your protection, is because of your love. You take your arms off of Job and see what happens to him. And God said this, I have faith in Job. I have so much faith in Job, I will release my protection. The only thing you cannot do is you cannot kill him. And I guarantee you, Job will not curse me and he will not deny me. And all kinds of stuff took place. He lost his family. He lost his cattle. He lost everything about him. His body was in ruins. His friends <laughs> told him to deny God. Job looked up at God. And he would not deny him. He said, he alone is worthy to be blessed and to be praised. God created me. And God that created me owns me. Wow. In the midst of terrible circumstances as Job had in 9-11, just like Job, in terrible personal circumstances, God was in control. And the same place he was when Abram lapsed his faith. This is a big one. Safeguarding the fulfillment of his promise. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 15. It might be successfully argued that this was the pivotal point of Christian Islam religion. See, Abraham was promised the descendants as many as the sea, uh, sand on the sea. But he was getting up in years and his wife was past barren stage, or fertility stage. And uh, Abraham said, hey, God, uh, this ain't going to happen. So he found him a handmaiden by the name of Hagar. And he slept with Hagar, and they had a son. And his son was named Ishmael. And Ishmael was not the promised child of God. That was Isaac. So as Ishmael and Isaac grew... God commanded Abraham to cast him out. So Hagar and Ishmael left the family folk. And Isaac and Abraham become the promise. And sometimes we get ahead of God as well. And sometimes we say, God, I think you need my help. 
I don't think you're quite doing it the way I want you to do it and how fast I want you to do it. So sometimes we get ahead of God, but God doesn't need our help to fulfill his promises. Every promise that the God, that God has given to us in the Bible is going to come to place. In the lapse of faith, in the times of Abraham, in the chaos of today, of Islamic terrorism, started in the lack of faith. Started because of evil. It started way back in Genesis when Abraham, the father of the modern country, didn't wait on God. He decided to do what he wanted to do. But God still said this. He said, even in spite of your lack of faith, my promises will stand firm. Abraham is the descendants of thousands of the sea. Abraham is a great patriarch, even though Abraham did get a hold of God, ahead of God. But still, God was there. In the same place he was when Joseph was riding in jail. His brother sold him into slavery. Sold into Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife accused him of rape. Thrown in jail. Even, even his attendants in jail forgot who he was. But here's what he does. He accomplishes his will in spite of our circumstances. God's will will always prevail when we faith, have faith in God. Here's what Joseph said. You meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. In our finite minds, we see our desires. We see what we see, but God has a bigger picture in every area of our life. Evil is relevant. It is so real. It's in our hearts. It's in our lives. It's everywhere around us. But what we have to do is we have to understand, as a child of God, I have broken the curse of sin, and I have an opportunity to have fellowship and faith with Christ. Because not that I do not sin, but sin does not have to have dominion over me because Jesus has saved me. Joseph said this, you meant it for harm, but God meant it. For good. Where was, not, where was God on 9-11? Moses was on the back side of the desert. And what was he doing out there? He murdered. He was afraid that he was going to be put to death. But what he was doing on the back side of the desert, he was being prepared for a greater service than he could ever possibly imagine. He thought he was going to live in the palace. But God had a plan for him to deliver the people into the promised land. Jonah, being swallowed by a fish. He was learning things back in those days. He was a prophet, but he was rebelled against God. He did not want to go to Nineveh. So what he did, he rebelled against God, and God stopped him in his tracks. And he said this, learn that God's way is the best way. God's way is the protective way. You can rebel. You can live in hatred. You can live in animosity and even the evil, but if you're a child of God, God will stop you in your tracks. And he will cause devastation upon our life until we first adhere to what God wants in our lives. Peter and John was beaten for preaching the gospel, ridiculed, laughed at. But here's what God told them. I'm going to give you greater opportunities to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Because in chaos, God shows up. In 9-11, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of evil, in the midst of terrorism, that God could have stopped, but God gave us a free will. And when we have a free will, God is not in heaven saying, you can't. God is going to protect us when somebody does. We have to understand that. God is not shocked when sin takes place in this world. Paul, being stoned, shipwrecked, and in prison, yet being assured what he said, that all things work together for good to those who love him. In the midst of his life, a very horrible conditions. But God loved him. And chained in a prison cell, 
He says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I'm crown of righteousness is laid up for me. I am happy. What I have done in my life is for a purpose. I have changed people's lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a horrible death. But where was God on 9-11? The same place he was when Jesus was hung on the cross. Enduring the pain for the benefit of others. Oh, the horror. The agony. The Son of God. Part of the triune Godhead. Because of Genesis chapter 2. God's foreknowledge. He had a plan. And because evil entered into this world, because sin entered into this world, God said, I've got to do something about it. I sent my son to this earth, into this evil world, to cover your sins. The horror lived 33 years of rejection. Three days of humiliation. The beating, the stoning, the agony of the cross. The nakedness and the embarrassment. It's God. Because of evil, God sent his son. And although all the physical problems were terrible, God created the heavens and the earth and the heaven became physical and stretched his arms and died on the cross because of evil and the physical punishment people have been dying on the cross for many years up to that point the difference is this when Jesus stretched forth his hands laid down his feet the nails through his hands and the nails through his feet look scarred beyond any recognition of man. God turned his back. And the sin of your life, of my life, was thrust upon him to cover all of the evilness of this world and the sin of your life. If it was just my sin, it would be horrific enough. But it was the sin of all humanity thrust upon him. All the physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain was thrust upon Jesus, upon his back, so we can have security in Christ. So the evilness of this world, the sin of this world, cannot touch us because we are bought by the blood of of Jesus Christ. Remember that picture of Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3? They're abandoned from the presence of God. The Garden of Eden was in the perspective of God's presence. And Satan was kicked out. Adam and Eve was kicked out. They were banished. So they started walking away. They had their covering of skin and the covering of fig leaves upon their body. They walked away a few hundred yards, knowing that they will never have the presence of God again in their life. Humiliated. Scared. Something new. They've only known the presence of God. And because of evil, and because of sin, and because of rebellion, and because of deception, they went against God. Their head hung low. They had no idea what to do. They didn't know what was next. They've only known the presence and the peace and the place of God. So they walked away. But as they walked away, they saw the presence of God standing on the side. And they saw the Garden of Eden guarded well, by an angel with a sword. And they knew that they would never be able to ever go back into the presence of God again. But out of the presence of God, comes this figure, comes this figure as part of God, but yet not God. And they walked up to Adam and Eve. They put his arms around Adam and Eve and said, stop, stop. 
They turned, and this figure walks up to the throne, walks up to the presence, into the entrance of the garden. And the angel, with his sword, slashes him and kills him. But as he kills him, the door of the presence of God is opened. That's exactly what God has done for us. Because of our sin, we are outside of God's presence. But once God sent his son to come to us, and we receive him, he takes our penalty, and he walks into death. And because he walked into death, and because he took our sins upon his back, the presence of God is open to us. Oh, we can live in fear. We can live in, in, e in evil. But what God wants, he wants us to wrap his arms around him and trust him. Where, where was God in 9-11? He was in control. Oh, do we understand it? No. But in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. The bottom line is, God was not surprised on 9-11. But he was saddened by it. God did not cause 9-11. But he does comfort those who are affected by it. God may not prevent future, future attacks of terrorism. But he will always provide rescue for those affected by it. Evil is prevalent. Even in our own lives. We may not kill 3,000 people on one day. But God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart of man. And the Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. And we could do very horrendous acts and not even think about what we are doing. But affecting a person is the same thing as affecting 3,000 people. When we have a wicked heart, when we allow evil to dwell within our lives without asking God to forgive us, what we are doing is we are doing the same thing radical terrorism has done. We are defeating the purpose and the power of God because of our will. What we need to do is ask God to forgive us. Ask God to help us. God is in control. God has given us a free will. And in Genesis chapter 3, evil came to this earth. But here's what God told Satan. He said, yeah, you're cursed. I am going to bruise your head. And you will bruise his heel. In other words, Jesus wins. Satan, you may have a time. And evil may be rampant. But the closer we get to my return, I am going to give the peace and the power of God. It's going to be tough. Evil is wicked. Evil hurts. But in the presence of God, as a child of God, in the, in the peace of God, as a child, what we can do is say, I'm trusting in God in the midst of calamity. That's why we get together right after 9-11 and we pray. We ask God to protect those that are hurting. It was devastating. I heard somebody say this week that if you're a freshman in high school, it is taught as a history lesson. Because you weren't alive during that time. A freshman in high school, 15 years ago. We turn around, it's going to be 20 years. It's going to be 30 years. And sometimes we turn around and we take things for granted. We forget how horrific it is. But the peace of God, what we must do, is we must trust in him. We must love him. We must understand that he did not create evil. We... Humanity chose to be deceived and accept not only the good that God created for us, but accept the evil. In that day, you will know the difference between good which you've experienced and evil in which you will experience. And we are all benefactors 
of that decision. And what we must do is we must never doubt the presence and the peace of God. Oh, there's going to be all kinds of questions. But the safety, the safety that we have as a child of God is that Jesus took my sin. Jesus took the evil that was within me and he died for me. He covered my sins, made them as white as snow. And when I die, the evil that I have had, the sin that I have committed, God has wiped it clean. And I get to have the presence of God. In the Garden of Eden, just like Adam and Eve, I get to experience the presence of God because the peace of God and the presence of Jesus has taken over my life. And I say praise Jesus for that. We need to have the perspective that God is in control. There is nothing that can take place that God does not know about. And Jesus is our intercessory prayer. He's in the heavens today praying for us, loving us, and helping us, and encouraging us. But here's the deal. He does not make us. You make a choice. You have to make that choice. I have to make that choice. Our last breath in life is a choice that we make. What do I do with the life that I was given? Do I use it for evil or do I turn it for good? A lot of people will choose evil. But God's people will turn it for good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we know where you are. We know the presence of God and we know the peace of God. But we also know the devastation of sin and evil within this world. So I ask you to convict us. I ask you to challenge us. I ask you to be with us in every area of our life. And as we sing this song, as we offer our prayers to you, Lord, guard our hearts and our minds. Give us a peace that passeth all understanding. And Lord, where we need you, I ask you to be there. We need our salvation and we need our forgiveness. And Lord, I pray on that day of 9-11, 15 years ago, when you helped so many get through a horrible time and so many were ushered into your presence and so many were ushered in the outer darkness, I pray that decision can be done now instead of later. I pray that you'll give us that peace and understanding. In Jesus' name we do pray.